Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Making Progress with Mike Gizertel or the other way around. In any case, lecture number, video number seven today, titled Intelligence is the Ultimate Resource. And this is in a subsection of the many topics I'll be covering in this channel in the future of philosophy. So right into it. Uh, Scott, the video guy, is this our first actual topic? No, second topic lecture. That we did the trolley. Didn't we do the trolley? Check that video out if you guys have seen it. That's video number six. We are numbering all these to make it really easy for you guys to search. Because if you come here and you realize you like the stuff, you can always go back and watch the older videos. Um, they all kind of logically sequence together to some extent. So it'd be really nice. All right. So today I am going to be making the case that intelligence is a very great thing and dispelling some common myths about intelligence. First, I'm going to try to answer the question of what intelligence actually is. Why is more of it better, which will be my assertion. Trying to get our handle on some of the downsides of higher intelligence and talk soberly through them. Talk about if we do think, hey, intelligence is a good thing, what we can focus on both individually and socially to sort of promote the better use and expansion of higher intelligence and what the future of intelligence is, I was going to say going to bring, but per the revelations of the GPT revolution is already bringing and more to come. So what is intelligence? In a very simple way to define intelligence, because there are more complex ways to define it, intelligence is the ability to solve problems. And usually, and especially, it is more often cited as the ability to solve abstract reasoning problems not super proximate, simple problems. And a good way to think about intelligence, if you have trouble defining it or have trouble understanding what abstract reasoning is, don't worry, we'll get into that in a sec. It's like what you can figure out better than your dog. What is it that you have that allows you to figure stuff out better than your dog? And is generally not senses because your dog has really finely tuned senses. Like its vision's not that good, but its smell is unbelievable. It can hear better than you. It can pick up on emotional cues really well. But there's something going on inside that brain of a dog which doesn't connect the dots quite as well. And it makes dogs very poor problem solvers compared to humans. So that big chasm between the abilities of dogs and humans is mostly accounted for by intelligence, the ability to solve more abstract problems. So to dive deeper as to how intelligence arises as a quality of systems inside an evolving framework like the universe, some deep stuff here, get ready. So at some level of intelligence, a relatively low level, organisms begin to gain the ability to decipher some patterns, it could be like one pattern. It almost certainly in evolutionary history is one pattern to start, right? When I go towards the heat, my body degrades. When I go away from the heat, my body does not degrade and I feel fine. So lesson learned after some time, heat equals go the other way. That's a logical rule, actually. It's an if-then statement, which is the beginning of intelligence. Now, those are very simple proximate problems. At some higher level of intelligence, organisms can start to remember solution classes to similar problems and replicate them quicker and better. So you've solved a problem like this before, you sort of know which way it's going. You may remember this ability developing in yourself when you were learning like, oh gee, how to do fractions or how to carry things around an equation, around the equal sign. You've run into a similar equation. You're like, oh, oh, no, 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 hold on. I know this. And you might not have a deeper intuition yet about what mathematics really means and it, it are able to describe exactly what that equation says, but you know how to solve it because you've just run into a whole bunch of them before. At a still higher level, organisms can deduce a few more things. They can deduce algorithmic problem-solving methods that work on entire classes of problems. And an algorithm is a really cool thing because it's a formal procedure which almost always leads to a solution that is quite robust, very likely to be true. And 
An algorithm is a very categorically different thing than a statistical pattern guess. So in the earlier example of you, you have seen a bunch of math problems before, and you know that you typically it's like, you know, 3x equals C or some shit like that. And you're like, I, I, I know I've run into this. You sort of divide both sides by three and you get what X equals. I don't know why you really divide both sides by three, but you do. Cool. You've gleaned that that's a thing that happens. If you have an algorithmic solution, you have a set of de uh, defined rules, right? Find the constant, find a variable of question, divide both sides equals answer. And that's a very, very simple algorithm. But if you have an algorithm that's dependable, you can apply it and get really quick solutions to things and get solutions to problems that might not look pattern-wise like you expect them to, but you apply the algorithm because the underlying pattern is similar or the same, it gets a really good result. If you do enough algorithmic work, you uh, sort of export enough algorithms, attempts at formalized solutions, you're going to start to understand that Algorithms only work because of one thing, and that's formal logic. If you deploy enough of these and get feedback, you eventually will pick up on formal logic, which is what mathematicians in our history had done, very, very importantly. And once you be become able to pick up on formal logic, you start to stack up formal logical rules. And, you know, if this, then that, things like that. And once you have these logical rules, you begin to deploy them on trying to understand the universe around you. And you begin to understand the structure of the universe in which you as an individual or an organism in this example uh, lives and acts and runs into problems. So yet now that you have logical rules, logical rules are like the ultimate Swiss army knife for dealing with intellectual problems which all problems at some level are intellectual. So once you begin to deploy these logical rules, you start to understand the structure of the universe really well. And then at some point, you turn that understanding of the universe that you're gaining onto yourself. And you begin to understand your structure and function and your place in the world. A quick example. It used to be that we didn't really understand what animates organisms because our logical rules were not so powerful. And also, even when they were powerful, after the definitely the, the Greek times and for sure after the Latin times, we had a real good set of logical operations to understand the world. We had systems of writing and memory to, to remember what they were. It, it just hadn't, that understanding of the world started to get to really good at understanding things like agriculture, how to construct a home, how to clear a forest and use the clearings to burn stuff. But it hadn't penetrated deeply into biology yet. So what we understood about organisms was uh, we just sort of put like this uh, logical stopgap of like they're magic and they're alive and they have souls. So like that's they operate with these interesting logical relationships. We, we haven't penetrated exactly what that is. So our ability to turn back on ourselves and view ourselves from the perspective of other organisms, which we are, was eh, not so impressive. But after, let's say, the 1900s, especially after Darwinian stuff happened, germ theory of disease, et cetera, we end up realizing like, oh, hold on a second. We're just a class of animals. And if we have studied a bunch of things about animals that happen to be true, medical things, psychological things, we can now turn back and look at ourselves and go, hold on, hold on a second. We are animals. And our bodies operate by very similar, the same in many cases, systems of rules and the structures are the same. And now we begin to know ourselves really well. And that's a big deal. So what I started with, real quick, just to reframe, is you you start with problem-solving methods that are statistically derived. Like you're just guessing, but you're guessing really well because you've run into those problems before. Then you develop formal algorithms to solve small classes of problems. As you deploy algorithms for long enough, you begin to realize that a lot of classes of problems have commonalities and that all of your algorithms that work versus the ones that work worse versus the ones that don't work at all, you can filter out the logical rule sets in them that because they are logical rule sets, you've just, you've sort of decoded the universe. Logic, in a sense, decodes the universe because it describes how everything operates. If you zoom in enough and go, oh, oh, this is happening. Got it. Once you determine that you have formal logic, you start applying it to everything. F the application of formal logic to everything is how every single science is born. Physics, chemistry, math, 
sociology, biology, astronomy, or just applying logical rules. Like if this star moves across the sky this way, and we know the earth rotates that way, it's geometry, then this star must be with its redshift or whatever, that many millions of miles away. Logic, that's it. So as your ability to apply formal logical rules expands, if, uh, at first it paints the world around you and then you turn it on yourself, it paints you, and then you know a lot more stuff. Your understanding of the universe starts to get better. So that is a real good jump off point for the real benefits of intelligence to start being seen. If you have an understanding of the universe's structure, to at least some extent, and you have an ability to apply formal logic to solve problems within that structure, it's a structure that becomes tractable. You can do something about it. What you end up getting after time, after attempts to solve problems in the universe, is a bunch of failures of solutions to actually get you what you want and a bunch of success. And you learn from failures and successes, boosting your understanding of the universe's structure and your understanding of an ability to deploy logic. You get better at both because you're training your system of understanding, your intelligence on, well, the biggest data set in the world, which is the whole universe. So you start to get much better at understanding problems and at solving them, which is a really good thing. When you have that, what you have is a system that becomes better and better at solving problems over time, predictably, not through magic, not through magic. And what this ends up happening is because we're solving problems, which at least we conceive of as problems, because you could say like, well, you know, Jupiter goes around the sun, like that's not a problem. We don't need to solve that, like for sure. But like famine's probably a problem. Giant predatory birds eating us is a problem and so on and so forth. So you become better and better at solving problems over time. And then what happens is you get better and better at turning the universe around you. And we become better at turning the universe around us into a, a, a lower and lower problem space. It just has fewer problems compared to when we started out. For example, none of this is fantasy, the home. If you're at home right now watching this, take a look around you and really try to try to feel what's going on. The home is a great example of how many problems we have solved pretty damn algorithmically at this point that are no longer things that you really worry about outside of something going very wrong. For example, your home in its construction has illustrated that we have solved the private, the problem of internal climate. Like your home is whatever temperature uh, really that you want it to be. That's amazing. If you were in a, a some kind of teepee or hut and you had something burning in the middle of it, you will learn that that climate problem to have similar temperatures everywhere in, in the inside a, a domicile is very difficult to solve and comes with noxious gases and all this other crazy stuff. So we solve a climate problem internally. You've solved the safety problem. You probably don't go to the bathroom in your home at night. Realistically, darkness being a fear enhancer aside, realistically expecting something to jump out of behind your dresser, like the analog to jumping out of the bushes and trying to eat you. But if you woke up in the middle of the night to pee in our hunter-gatherer times, absolutely you have a very decent chance of getting eaten alive by whatever the hell is waiting for you. So we solve safety. Food. You just simply go to your pantry or refrigerator and there it is. That's a huge category of problems solved. Physical comfort. Oh my God. Your couch. I'm going to put the finest point I can on this. A well-made modern couch. It's not even expensive. Just a good couch like the crappy couch you had in your dorm that was just amazing. There is no analog to that level of comfort in our ancestral environment. Go outside, go outdoors, see what you can find to sleep on that's that comfortable. It doesn't exist. No number of leaves, no like mats woven from straw that indigenous people have. There is no comparison. It is objectively the most superior solution so far to the comfort problem. It's such a good solution. People get obese because they don't want to get off the couch. Holy crap. We're really starting to understand the, round, the world around us with using intelligence and really being able to solve more and more problems. Simply put, intelligence makes stuff better, period. That's it, because it solves problems better and better over time. And it's just not that complicated. That's what intelligence gets us. It is a Swiss army knife of problem solving. And as we cut things up with the Swiss army knife and use the little screwdriver function that no one ever does, we end up making the world around us into a less problem containing set 
mathematically and a more problem already solved set. That makes things better, plain and simple. All right. All right. Let's get a clap. Slow clap. Hell yeah. Intelligence is great. Oh, but hold on, you say, shaking your iPhone with your headphones in. And your mom's like, what, what, what's wrong, Billy? You're like, nothing. Dr. Mike's not addressing the downsides of high intelligence. Oh, you're right. But I'll fix that problem right now. So here we go. Does intelligence have downsides? Yes. I thought of a few of them. Maybe you can think of more. So hit me up in the comments. I think I have at least five. Let's go through them really quick, and then I'll try to go back through them again and see if we can wiggle out how much of a problem these things really are, how much of a downside intelligence really have. First, if you are smarter, you can make bigger mistakes in action because you move bigger chunks of the universe around because you know what you're doing better. So, for example, a toddler is insufficiently intelligent to build a 10-story uh, counterweighted crane to lift heavy objects. And so if a toddler drops a sand bucket, he might hurt his toe. No big deal. If engineers miscalculate with all their big brains and their intelligence, they got smart enough to build a huge crane that's 10 stories tall. And then they miscalculate one of the wires breaks, the counterweight falls, killing a family of 18 toddlers. Strange family. Why are they out by themselves? Maybe they're alien toddlers. Good. We don't need packs of toddlers roaming wild in the cities anyway. But seriously, a crane falling. Holy crap. That's a big deal. And you got to get real smart to be able to make mistakes that grand. Don't worry, I'll have more examples of these in just a bit. Okay, you can make bigger mistakes. Totally. Got it. That's a problem for sure. Second, you can get a good at not just making mistakes, but doing harm because you can design things that cause harm with your higher intelligence. Nuclear weapons, bioweapons, AI weapons, all kinds of weapons even require intelligence to do harm. So the more intelligence you have, the more potential for harm doing you have. Big problem. Definite problem. Problem number three, the resultant increase of intelligence in society, let's call it, presence of intelligence in society, means that the way statistics works inevitably is that some people are going to be smarter than others, which can feel icky, and I feel that for sure. It's like, ooh, ooh, that, ooh that's really a thing. That's not a comfortable thing. And on occasion, maybe quite regularly, those smarter people may choose to exploit the less smart people and not an exploit in capitalism. We all win together kind of way and exploit in like a really nasty kind of way where the person being exploited gets the shaft and the person exploiting is like, man, see, they wear a monocle and well, you know the rest. So that's not great. Definitely a downside. And Something that's commonly raised is a point, uh, the, the fourth point I was able to come up with on intelligence downside is you sort of figure out how hopeless existence is as opposed to the, you sort of harken back to the days of uh, blissful ignorance when you weren't intelligent to understand eh, how really doomed we really are. I mean, no, I think the French have probably perfected this uh, of eh, intelligence. What is this? You discover that all is pointless. No. And you're like, I, I don't know. Your accent sounds cool. So um, I'm down with that. But uh, yeah, there's people that say that. We'll talk about that in a sec. Is that really the case? And there's also the idea that smarter people have like lower social skills or more neuroses and stuff like that. Maybe that's also the case. It's definitely something people say a lot. All right. Let's deal with these one by one. So first is the claim that you can make bigger mistakes in action. And that is definitely true. And in any new problem space that you enter to try a candidate class of solutions, this is definitely a risk. You make big mistakes when you don't really know what you're doing yet, but you have a lot of intelligence to move around heavy machinery and change the universe in a big way. But over time, in any single problem class, higher intelligence makes the mistakes less likely to occur. So if we're got a, a square mile where we're doing zero mining, when we start mining, shit can go down. The mine can explode. Poison gas can leak out. Yeah. And if we weren't smart enough to do mining, it would have never happened. It would just sat there. But after some time, we get really good at mining, and then the probability of disaster falls exponentially. Super, super low. Especially if we culturally do the work of 
re- trying to reduce our hubris. Like we shouldn't be like, you know, that like it's definitely a trope. It's almost certainly was never real. But that whole like, man, nah, see, we can change the whole world. See, yeah, you know, blow up that mountain and build a canal. Nah. And then like the river diverts and kills everyone. You're like, well, nah, oops. Like that sort of stuff, definitely bad. So when we come to problems in which we're moving around large chunks of the universe that could potentially go awry, we have to have reverence for that. And we have to be very patient and very careful. Definitely. But if we're talking about progress slash survival, same thing, being our goal, if we choose to deploy intelligence in the ideal world, we get this much benefit. If we don't deploy intelligence at all, we get this much benefit. Nothing happens. All costs, no benefits. Here's the ideal benefit of intelligence with no mistakes and no weird learning problems to begin with and no disasters because you're not moving the universe around. It's just magic. You just know the right answer right from the start. Yeah, that's up here, but that's not realistic. What's realistic is intelligence is going to have some traction problems at first and their mistakes will be made. And so you go down to about here, which is still a huge net positive of improvement versus not trying to deploy intelligence at all. Imagine that your car breaks down in the middle of the heat in Arizona, some highway no one ever goes on. And you go, okay, I'm going to use my brains to try to fix the car. And someone sitting you, he's like, don't try to fix it. Don't try to just make it worse. Girl, we ain't going anywhere. It's already worse. It's as bad as it gets. Can I potentially wire the wrong wires and the car blows up, killing us both? Yes. But if we don't use any intelligence at all, what do we get? I mean, at all, at all, you can't even assume that food is food and then you don't eat and then you die. Or in the case of the Arizona stranded car situation, you just sit in the car until it gets to 150 degrees and you boil to death. And that's that. There is not an alternative that's realistic in which you do not use intelligence. Yes, the use of intelligence is fraught with a probability of failure, but it is also the only outcome set that has a probability of success. You will not get through the universe as a survivor in the long term if you do not deploy intelligence. That's crazy. So that's huge net benefit to deploying intelligence. And it gets better because intelligence has been and is now, very obviously, exponentially rising because we learn from our mistakes, making us smarter. And then that ability to be smarter now means we learn even better from our mistakes. Because intelligence exponentially rises, the probability that you're going to really screw things up starts to fall. And the, even if it doesn't, even if it's really high, the height of the bar graph for net positives, area under the curve, just goes up and up and up and up and up. And the not deploying intelligence part, wherever you stop trying to deploy intelligence, that's where it sits forever. If you're saying, I'm only going to pro- approach the world with one level of intelligence, I'm never going to learn from my mistakes. I'm just going to do the same thing I always have. You're going to be stuck at a certain net benefit which is nice, but the net benefit of the other side goes up way, way higher. So the idea that you can make bigger mistakes in action is the same thing that you would tell to a pro bowler that was about to win his 10th game in a row. Be like, hey, don't go out there. You you could hurt your wrist. You could hurt your wrist. Be like, yeah, yeah, I know. That's what we do in bowling. Just risks everywhere. Back in my day when I was bowling, instead of the gutter, they had crocodiles tried to eat your ball. And you would have to, if your ball stopped, you'd have to go in there and retrieve it. So a lot of guys go down like that. Frank. Frank was a good guy. Jesus. How many people we lost? Crocodile bowling. In any case, yeah, there's downsides to stuff, but the net positive is still enormous. It's like someone saying, hey, you can make like a million dollars an hour doing this job. And you're like, but I don't get that hour back. I wanted to play video games. Like, that's true. I wish there was a way for you to make a million dollars and not lose an hour. But this is just the, the hands that you've been dealt. So unfortunately, you're going to have to work for an hour to make a million. Versus you could just not work. Then you make nothing. That's the real thing. Second, you can get really, really good at doing harm with higher intelligence. Definitely true. Absolutely true. But there is a game theoretic thing that I think a lot of people either don't know or forget when they talk about this problem is that uh, inherent to seemingly the structure of the universe, defense is categorically easier than offense in your average set of cases. 
defense is something you can arrange with less expense and more effect per any given finite amount of resources. So if you have two countries fighting and their armies fight, through a lot of averaging, it's beyond the scope of this conversation, defenders generally have like a three to one advantage over offenders, over attackers. So if you have two intelligent beings going at it, at first they may go at it for a while because they're not that smart. At some point they realize, you know what? Defense is inherently easier than offense. So if I want to be offensive and effective, I have to become overwhelmingly more intelligent, which happens and has led to some really bad stuff. But after a while, the continuous fighting resettles and you come back to the realization that defense is still more probabilistically a better outcome than offense. The world is built inherently to make offense more difficult than defense. That's what it seems like. And that means that over time, if everything becomes smarter, yes, crazy stuff will happen along the way, but eventually smart stuff will just be like, man, like, offense is really expensive and it had better have some good positive upsides for us to engage in. I'll come back to that in a second. There is a claim sometimes going around that smarter people are more evil and they are not. Smarter people are not more evil. In fact, on average, if you take within population, between populations, even between animals, if you want to do that sort of thing, Google what chimps do when they're having fun with each other. It's just highly disturbing. Generally, intelligence on average seems to make people and groups less evil. If you want to look into the correlations and cause and effect relationships between crime and intelligence level of the perpetrator, uh, have fun. That's a huge can of worms, but criminology is just crystal clear about it. People who are less intelligent tend to make way more criminal choices. They tend to be less likely to be ethical. So it's the opposite of what a lot of criticisms of intelligence and smart people have said. Intelligence, more intelligence on average makes you kinder seems at least correlationary. Now, it's not just correlation and here's why. At some level of intelligence, and it takes a while for some systems to get there, many of our human societies have gotten there for the most part already. Some have not. At some level of intelligence, organisms will recognize the objective superiority of teamwork, that working with other entities is in almost all cases better than working against them. Not all, but almost all. And these intelligent systems, we'll call them societies, tend to start to degrade their aggressive postures and scale them down and then end up being like, well, you know, we're not really trying to fight each other much anymore because fighting each other is really stupid in most cases. For example, try to envision a war between the modern European Union and the United States. It would be really stupid because the world is better with us not going to war. The world was better without Germany attacking everyone in World War II. I mean, in retrospect, hell yeah, it was. Uh, world War II did a lot of really bad things. Name a war that made a huge net benefit. There are a few. There are not that many. Most wars are stupid and make everyone else worse off. Don't worry, I'll have a video about that later describing exactly. So the teenage years, so to speak, of societal growing intelligence, like, you know, like conquistador era, Christopher Columbus, colonialism, all that other stuff, it definitely leads to some conflict for sure because smarter entities will interact with less intelligent entities at an individual and social level, but much more above that reduces jingoism substantially. Like Sweden's not trying to come after anybody anymore because most Swedish people and the average cultural je ne sais quoi of Swedish society recognizes that like, you know, war's pretty bad. And if, if you try to say, well, look, war has all these upsides, it's like, well, well what are they? If you know basic economics at all, which you can if you're relatively intelligent, you can be like, no, that's just all wrong. War actually has a subcategory of economics fallacy entitled almost uh, all of it is called the broken windows fallacy. Look it up. 
It's very, very simple. So, yes, on the way to increasing intelligence, there is absolutely going to be a thing where you get really good at doing harm and you're not that good at understanding harm is really bad to do yet. But eventually you come full circle and you still have a capacity to do great harm, but you generally just don't do it. And then you may even take your capacity to do harm and make it defensive in nature, like almost every modern military is postured around the world, except for Russia's. And they're losing the war right now. Thank God. All right. Number three, some people are smarter than others. And thus, more intelligence and intelligence in general, it's just icky. Why are we talking about it? First, in a society in which some people are smarter than others, uh, put another way, every society that has ever existed, we absolutely need and benefit from laws against fraud, exploitation, etc. If grandma doesn't know what contract she's signing, that is not a legally enforceable contract, which by the way is actually law in the United States. If you can demonstrate that you don't really know what you're doing when you're signing a contract, contracts don't mean nearly as much as you think. That's a good thing. We do not want a legal system in which smarter people can just ruthlessly exploit less intelligent people. We want to make sure that ruthless exploitation that harms another person is something that is generally made not legal or and the person really has to consent to it and really understand what's going on. You do want to sell one of your kidneys to science. Yes. You do understand what that means. You won't have a kidney anymore. Yes. You understand all the medical stuff that comes with that. Yes. Nobody's coercing you. Nobody. I just want $50,000 or whatever kidney costs in the open market. Okay. Here, sign here. You're good to go. But anything short of that, we absolutely need to understand smarter people will take advantage of us intelligent people. And of course, the other way around, that's what a mugging is, but yeah, let's we'll just focus on the one for now. But just because some people are good at some stuff, like being smart, doesn't mean that the rest of us have to get butthurt about it. Real talk. I can't play the violin. I tried. My parents sent me to conservatories. Scott, how many years was I at the conservatory for? Oh, man. Like, you did all your degrees there? So, like, eight, I think. Eight years. Eight years studying to play the violin. And I'm no good. I can't do it. TLDR, I've never played the violin. I can't play the violin at a world-class level. Fact. But because I see somebody play the violin at a world-class level, I'm not tripping about it. Why would I? That's their jam. And here's the thing. If I was to make an orchestra, I want them on my orchestra. I don't even want me on it. I'll, I'll sit there and pretend to play. Be like, hey, give me something without strings so I can just do this. I want people who are great at playing musical instruments on in my band, even though I'm not that good. Because it makes the band better, makes the sound better, makes us more money, and dot, 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 more groupies on the road. Scott, the video guy, knows what I'm talking about. He's a musician in his spare time. Scott, you got tested yet? I mean, let's see. You don't see any symptoms. Yeah. My, my test is, do I feel okay in the morning? <laughs> Can I pee straight? So, no burning. no burning. We're good. Yikes. So, inequality is a huge distractor from the fact that you're on the same team with smarter people that almost always makes the team better. Jeff Bezos, he's too smart. All right, well, was Amazon, is Amazon going away? Well, how am I supposed to get my stuff at home when I need it? With barely a thought, one click, it arrives. I want smart people like Jeff Bezos. I want Elon Musk. I want Bill Gates. I want all the mathematicians figuring out how to launch satellites and stuff so I can have cell service on my phone because when I'm in a tent camping, I want Pornhub. I don't want to, I don't want to have to think of stuff. There's five other people in a tent. They're all asleep. Whatever. Let's just go in the sleeping bag. A little light with the phone. You got it. You're Gucci. In any case, just because some people are smarter than others, the so what? We'll get to a little bit more of that later, but you do the best job that you can. And if there's smarter people around you, thank God. You want smarter people around you. If there's just less intelligent people around you, it's all on you, which is cool in a sense, but also not the ideal scenario for you selfishly. So anyone, everyone selfishly should generally, generally want more smart people around them. It's good to be the dumb person in the room. It's a room full of people that are unreal problem solvers. In the grand scale. I'm not a structural engineer. When I walk into a skyscraper, how do I know it's not going to fall down? Because I know really smart people built it. I'm not that smart. But my dumb ass is in there 
like using the restroom and looking out the windows and thinking, could I, you know, throw a penny down there and scare someone? Stuff like that. Stuff stupid people like me do. But thank God somebody built that skyscraper. And without smart, 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 super smart people, we just wouldn't have that. No skyscraper. Just short building, small building that collapses every now and again. It's nothing you want. It doesn't matter how icky it feels to not be the smartest person in the room. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. Number four. Apparently, if you get smart enough, you figure out how hopeless existence is. And I have not found that to be the case. Now, don't worry. Statistically, it's not the case either from psychological surveys. I'll get to that in just a sec. But there is nothing about getting smarter that will lead you to think that existence is hopeless. I haven't figured it out yet. There is a chasm when you abandon conventional religion and then you're in this nihilistic state for a little while intellectually, but then you go back up on understanding that like you just have to live your best life and build for progress in the future, what you're doing here on this channel, baby. And then once you start climbing that curve, that curve never ends. It's just paradise all the way up. So when you become smarter, when you realize that you're gaining intelligence, you should realize that now that I'm more intelligent, I can make tractable solutions to all these problems in my life. Problem. I'm not eating well and my health is bad. But hold on, I'm getting smarter. I'm getting from age 14 to 15 to 16 and my intelligence is radically elevating. I can now begin to read books on nutrition, go and watch YouTube videos of Dr. Mike Gisertel at Renaissance Periodization, what I know about that. And I can figure out how to do nutrition better and I can eat better and become healthier. I can go to school because I'm so smart and, and get a degree that is profitable and I can make money. I can start my own business. I can do all this other stuff and I can get a bigger house and, and a nicer car and more food in my pantry and vacation money. And I can help my friends and family out when they need a helping hand because I have so much money and I'm so good at stuff. And uh, gee whiz, yeah, intelligence is great. It's great. So you don't figure out how hopeless existence is unless you misconstrue emotions for actual thoughts, which is a whole other different topic I'll cover later. Now, one of the people I'm a huge fan of, Mr. Lex Friedman, he seems to think occasionally at least he throws out a question to a bunch of the smart folks that come on his podcast to ask him like, well, isn't like uh, getting smarter and being super smart, doesn't that lead you to sort of somehow realizing that life is hopeless? Um, uh, I think maybe the reason Lex thinks that is because he's like, painfully Russian and Jewish at the same time, just like me. And I feel that, bro. I wake up every day in existential angst. Like, oh, oh, it could just be summed up with that, that sound and that emotion. Is that There's just an emotion. That's not a consequence of logically thinking things through. There is no amount of that that's, well, I've thought about it deeply. And my conclusion is, oh, like, no, 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 no. That's just an emotion that comes with the package of being smart in some subclasses of humans. And I think that's just, uh, you know, the Russian doesn't help either because we're like, ooh, Valeria, why the world's so bad? Like, that's just a thing. Russian culture, Russian genetics, whatever it is, it comes stock. I don't think that's a real thing. Smart people do not predictably become more hopeless. And lastly, people say that smarter people have lower social skills. And it turns out that they actually don't. And you can look up this literature for yourself at any time you like. And the really interesting thing is that smarter people generally have better social skills than less intelligent people if you equate all the things that need equating and often just are do better in a bunch of other categories. So higher intelligence correlates really well to usually better outcomes on average in almost any variable you mention. On average, there's tons of exceptions. And some of those exceptions is, I think, what ends up culturally taking the place of what in our heads looks like a smart person is somebody who stands out. Somebody with Asperger's, for example, which is a, essentially a form of mild autism. And that means uh, there's a fraction of Asperger's people, not all of them, that are very intelligent in a few different ways, sometimes in all ways, but not in social intelligence because they have a literal defect in that ability, that subsystem of the brain to process emotional reactions from people's faces, to process like eye contact and all that stuff. And what ends up happening is people say, oh, the smart people, they're awkward and weird and they're professors and they don't look you in the eye and I don't want that. I don't want to become smarter. It'll make me like them. Which are the, like, that's just one way of being smart, but most other ways of being smarter means your social skills are elevated or neutral and you're just like a regular guy and you just happen to be super smart. You talk to a lot of really smart people, like anytime you go see your doctor, most people's doctors, because of the nature of the profession, they interact with people and they want that. Hey, you go talk to engineers, there's some, there's some fucking weird engineers. Because some of them are on the spectrum, like very far on the spectrum. That's the engineering. They work with little things or software and they don't have to interact with humans. But if you go talk to your doctor, your doctor's super smart. There's almost never, almost no one 
and the, and the average society is smart enough to be a doctor today in the United States. Very rare to be that smart. That's like a one in 100 level of intelligence. Like every 100 people in your high school class is smart enough to be a doctor. The rest are straight up just not on raw IQ, just not make a very good doctor. You talk to your doctor, you're talking to a real smart person. Is your doctor weird? It might, maybe. My doctor's always been super cool. Like, yeah, yeah, buddy, you lift weights. Yeah, I did that in college. That was sweet. And I'm like, right, right. I have an infection in my leg. Stop talking to me and treat me. Do the job, doc. Yeah, doctors hate me. Doctors hate this one weird trick. In any case, the Achilles heel view of higher intelligence is common. I think it's something that uh, tends to people sort of try to discover it in junior high and high school middle school and high school. And it's the idea that if you're smarter, some other stuff has to be wrong with you to compensate, but you're worse at sports, but you're bad at dealing with girls or socializing, but you're X, Y, Z. And this almost always, when looked at in the statistical literature, is a myth. It's just not true. More intelligence just makes you better at everything. And that's really the case. But it feeds into what I would call the cosmic justice fallacy. And that's actually something I took from economist and philosopher Thomas Sowell, is the idea that the scales are kind of balanced in a cosmic way. And that if someone's really good at some things, they have to be bad at others. The, the, I'm going to put some real reality onto you guys, some harsh, harsh truth. That's not true. Right? Some people can just be better at a bunch of stuff. And other people can just be worse at a bunch of stuff. There is no justice to it. It's just luck of the draw. Like you got just better genetics, better upbringing, and better everything else. You're just better at almost everything. And that's brutal to say, but it's also true. So we don't have to have this thing, well, well, what if we get smarter, but what else will happen that's bad? Maybe nothing. Maybe getting smarter is just better on average. So that's the deal with that. Now, if we buy into all that stuff I just said, okay, fine, Dr. Mike, we get it. Intelligence is great. What am I supposed to do about it? I'm just watching you on YouTube. Stop yelling at me, please. There are enough people yelling at me. What can we focus on? If we really think intelligence is a big deal, I think a couple of things. First, we can praise intelligence and having higher intelligence and having higher ability at every level, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, Twitter is, is where you go after college. That's the social scene. We can praise it culturally and nurture it without putting down folks who are less intelligent. So we can be totally okay to be like, Bill, you're real smart. And Bill being like, oh, stop, thanks, stop. I'm trying, I don't know, luck of the draw. And it can simultaneously be not okay at all to be like, well, Frank, you're an idiot. Like, that's a mean thing to say to somebody because you meant it mean. That's how you meant it is as an insult and there's no reason to do that. Some people are just straight up better looking than other people. Does that mean you need to go uh, find ugly people? Because there's people that are legitimately ugly this guy right here. Why, why would you go out of your way to insult them? That's a mean thing to say. Is, is there's no upside to it. You're just being a dick. So don't do that. We can absolutely praise people for high intelligence without ever making people who are lower in intelligence feel less than or dumb or worthless or bad. For example, it's like a team. Everyone on your basketball team needs better playing ability. From LeBron, who's amazing, but also could get better to the worst kid on the team. There is not a situation in which you're going to be like, hey, Frank is the worst kid on the team. You're an idiot. You suck. And you suck at basketball. Why would you say that? It doesn't matter how good LeBron is. He's good. That's great. But everyone benefits from everyone being as smart as they can be. And if someone's not as smart as somebody else, all right, that's just the situation. If you're a basketball coach and someone's bad at basketball, you don't yell at them. That's a stupid thing to do. You help them get better at basketball and you understand that they may be a role player and help in their own way. And that's totally cool. It is totally possible to be reverent of smart people. Some people will say like, look, if you actively say, hey, like you should look up to smart people and scientists and stuff. Hey kid, like, you know, you're, you, got, you got a spark in you. you. You could be real smart one day and that's great. You can make other people feel bad and that's a bad thing. But hold on a second. I think you can be very reverent of smart people without making dumber people, which is the rest of us, feel like crap. For example, how many kids when they saw Michael Jordan, the Michael Jordan playing basketball, how many kids felt bad about themselves? How many kids stopped playing basketball because we deified, turned into a god, Michael Jordan? 
wait, I think we're saying that backwards. He was so good at basketball that millions of people emulated him, some of them rising to whatever their best version of basketball was. Much of that was close to Jordan's level, or in LeBron's case and Kobe's probably at his level. Because we really put a lot behind basketball playing ability, and because we looked up to people that could do it better as examples, we just made the world play better basketball, and we didn't have to insult anybody in the process. Same with intelligence. If you deify smarter people and deify intellectual accomplishments, like Elon Musk apparently went and like read some physics books uh, and then just like redesigned the old Russian rocket system to be even better. Oh my God, be more like Elon. It's a God among us walking around. That's unbelievable. That's a great thing. And not all of us are that smart. Almost none of us are that smart. Who cares? Thank God he's on our team. And if I'm just a dummy compared to him, well, gee whiz, I'm just trying to do my best. So there's no reason for praising intelligence culturally to have any problems associated with it if you do it in a compassionate and not insane way where you bring other people down. Lifting others up, looking towards others as they're being uplifted culturally in the, in the society's eye does not require putting anyone down, period. <laughs> Number two is because we think intelligence is very important and this thing that we should hopefully be increasing or at least facilitating and supporting the expression of, we want to pr promote effective education which means hardcore diving with younger children into math, reading, logic, basic science, psychology, sociology, economics, all the stuff that teaches people to understand better and know better the world in which they live and then be able to reason through problems in the world better. And once they can do that in school, it, out into the industry they go, out into the working world, and they make more valuable things for all of us. There are a ton of knowledge sectors and in specific industries, which if you have a very well-rounded basic core, you can learn way better, faster, and more effectively and just create more value for society. But that core is really important and we need to treat that core super importantly. I'm gonna say some real controversial stuff now. They do gym class in school, they do art in school, they do music in school. I think those should be clubs. I don't think they should be classes at school. Classes at school should teach you to be smarter, should teach you to deploy intelligence more effectively to solve general classes of real world problems. Art is not a general class of real world problem. Music is not a general class of real world problem. Gym class, which I had a, got a PhD in, sure as shit, not a general class. Now, do these, does including these classes in the core curriculum have benefits? Yes, for sure. Become, you know, musical education is, is in so many ways fulfilling and so is art. And you got to get to know how your body moves in space and learn to play dodgeball, I guess. I don't know. Defending gym class is real tough. And by the way, nobody learns fitness habits from gym class. That's nonsense. So, that's a thing. Those classes do have benefits, but maybe we can move them more to extracurriculars and move the core in tighter to be good at like stuff Korean kids learn at school because, you know, they're better than us at school. Math, science, reading, hardcore logic, that kind of stuff. That's what we should be focusing on in education, not fluffy things. And fluffy things are great for after school programs. Right? So that's, uh, that's how that works. Next, number three thing that we can do, we can focus on, is individually put our best foot forward with really good work habits and trying to reduce the operation of logical fallacies in our brains. There's lots of smart people that spend their time doing tons of little BS tasks and never really sit down and do deep work. I'll have many videos later about how to organize your life in such a way that you can sit down and do deep work that really makes a difference to your own life, to your financial success, to how much pleasure you derive from work and your own life in general, and much more importantly than any of those in the grand scheme, how much value you provide to society as an intelligent person. In addition to that, intelligent people are often, well, often by definition, intelligent people are really smart, but they may have some in, inbuilt logical fallacies where 
they can do really high processing speed. Their throughput is really high. Their ability to collect an understanding of a lot of data at the same time is really high. But then the logical fallacies get there, and they pervert the output of that system to give you predictably wrong classes of solutions to, to various problems. And so we should be working at a bunch of levels of society, voluntarily, of course, to surface that logical fallacies are occurring and try to reduce them, right? And there's tons of logical fallacies all over the place. I'll have tons of lectures about those later, but it pains me in a special way to see smart people committing logical fallacies. That's a really, really bad thing. We have a lot more to say about that later. And the fourth thing we can do is put a lot of thought into enhancing our own intelligence. That is what the next section is all about in the future of intelligence. How many things do I have to say about that? I have to say three things about it. And point number three is a doozy. First, intelligence has such a huge lever for, well, solving problems. And solving problems is, comes real close to the entire reason that we're alive. And even if it's not the reason we're alive, if you solve more problems, life gets better, sort of by definition. Intelligence is something that if we can increase it, we should really, really try to do that. And there are a few ways to boost intelligence that are possible. Some of them are already here to some extent. Some of them are hopefully en route. I'll go by how big of a difference this can make on overall societal and individual human intelligence. First are intelligence-boosting drugs, otherwise known as nootropics. They, there probably are no actual nootropics currently, and I don't care what that guy who has a supplement company says. Maybe modafinil is a true nootropic, but there are not many other actual nootropics, perhaps none. If we had smart drugs that actually made you smarter in some capacity, even if they just made your thoughts a little bit clearer for you or something like that with minimal downsides, maybe they enhance memory recall, whatever process. And there's lots of processes that can be attractable with drugs. There's an entire class of processes, um, basically multi-layered abstract thinking that drugs can't really do because it's just a matter of how much cortex you have and you have to physically build more brain tissue, which drugs don't really do. But there's a ton of stuff that on the borderlands, drugs can potentially, theoretically, make you smarter on the margins, make everyone who takes them smarter. And here's, here's, here's this. That should not be a taboo. Anytime I ever hear bioethicists talk about, well, smart drugs or open up their own can of worms. What's that? More intelligence? Get out of my face. Smart drugs are amazing in theory, and we should have them in practice. And a huge fraction, if we get our stuff together as a society, which I'm trying to put my own little drop into the ocean with, with doing this channel, we should be working towards making smart drugs. Because if people become smarter by five IQ points on average, the benefits to society are just this boom, just this groundswell of massive benefit. Because here's an industry that does not benefit from us getting smarter. Here it is, ready? It doesn't exist. Everything benefits from more intelligence because everything that we consider a problem gets more solved with higher intelligence. Smart drugs, really good idea. We should be working on it. Point number two, intelligence boosting genomic inter intervention. Genomic intervention that boosts intelligence. Genetic engineering to take whatever intelligence you have right now, or in another sense, a newborn baby or embryo, going in there and altering DNA or going into your live organism and giving you, injecting you with a virus, let's say viral vector, that makes you wake up two days later after having a mild flu and being like, holy crap, I'm smarter. That's how it would feel to have genomic intervention for increased intelligence from genetic engineering. And it's scary. It's scary, right? Scary. Why is it scary? It's been in a bunch of movies. It's scary there. Um, what's so scary about getting smarter? What's so scary about genetically engineering people to become smarter? Now, we're assuming here that these drugs have been well vetted and tested on animals and like that's all good. If you think getting genetic engineering that makes you smarter is bad, would you resist genetic engineering to – enlarge your genital size? Or are you against like ass reshaping 
Like a girl gets a, some kind of shot and then a couple days later, she's like, oh, butt feels weird. And after a few months of redistribution of fat, which was the genetics does, she gets like the perfect Kim Kardashian in her prime ass. And you're like, God damn it. Stupid genetic engineers. They did it again. They're sullying the world with this nonsense. I liked it natural and flat and irrelevant and concave and awful. No, no, we can do better. We can do better. Genetic engineering to increase intelligence is an enormous net positive. Enormous net positive. But hold on. You say, hold on. This is, oh, wait, 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 wait. But the rich will have access first, and then inequality goes up. I hear you. So what? If there's rich people over there that are getting smarter, how does that hurt me? They're able to make higher quality products that they now compete with each other and make in those products. So it drives the overall price of those products down. They're able to make new discoveries and new medical advances. They're able to teach me things better because they're now so smart they can relate to me better. What, what is it that I'm losing out on if other people around me become smarter? Is it the jealousy of the fact that I wasn't also made smarter? Is that, is that really what inequality comes down to? It, maybe. So we have to shift our perspective here and understand something that we are on a team together, all of society and any some small subfraction of it, we are on the same survival team. Just because Michael Jordan gets better coaching from the coaches doesn't mean that your team gets worse. You win more championships. You want him to get the best coaching. You want Michael Jordan to become even better at basketball. Oh, but there's no justice. What about me? The justice is you got rings on your fingers. Because everyone's working for the same team, yes, richer people will afford these smart genomic interventions and, and drugs first, and they'll get way smarter than the rest of us, totally. And then there'll be more Elon Musks around. What has Elon done with 10 years of his career? Uh, revolutionized the electric car and power systems and all this other crazy stuff? I, I, I feel like more of him would be great. Would you take a genomic intervention that made you dumber, that made rich people dumber? Really? You want Jeff Bezos to show up to work and be like, ah, let's shut Amazon down. It's too complicated. I can't figure this out anymore. What? Why? Just because some people are doing better, that does not mean you're doing worse. The pie that we have is a pie we build together. There's not some amount of resources in the world that you have access to that if the rich people get more, you get fewer. That's just a wild economic fallacy beyond, oh, don't worry, I'll address that later. You can Google that yourself. Like zero-sum fallacy is a fallacy. Richer, smarter people make more stuff for all of us. They make the world better for us all. Thank God they're around. Let's get more of them going. All about the team. Now, here's the thing. The way that drugs and genomic interventions work is it's going to be a pill or it's going to be an injection. Name one pill or injection that is still preposterously expensive after 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of development. Other than weird government regulation, which we would also do better if we were smarter, it's just not a thing that happens. Was the COVID-19 vaccine or the, the vaccines against COVID, which saved 20 million lives globally? Get at me in the comments about that. Uh, it's just true. I don't know how else to say it. Yes, the vaccines had downsides. Yes, the leftists went too far. I agree. But also the vaccines are great. In any case, those vaccines, how much do they cost? Billions, right? Now, how much do they cost per shot per person? I don't know, nothing. I've never remembered paying for a vaccine. And if you actually had to pay money for it, it's like, I don't know, 10 or 20 bucks. Because like, you know, 200 million people need it. And then each one pays 20 bucks. The pharmaceutical company, they're like, holy crap, that's billions of dollars. This is amazing. And by the way, gen genetic engineering interventions would be something that multiple pharmaceutical companies could work on. And they would compete ruthlessly with each other. So yes, rich people get it at first. And then less rich people get it. And the price goes down and down and down. And then voila. And here's the thing. I am generally very skeptical and reserved about subsidies from government because they generally pervert market incentives and market forces, and they end up making the scarce allocation of resources less efficient over time. But there are exceptions to that, or at the very least, ones where I'm willing to squint and go like, okay, I know this is a net not as positive, but it's politically going to be really good, so let's do it. I would absolutely sign a law if I was king of the world or whatever that said that uh, – if you can't afford IQ boosting genomic intervention or drugs, it will be provided to you free of charge because the people that can least afford it are also probably the least intelligent people. And if you make them smarter, it makes the 
a humongous difference in their lives and everyone around them, even more difference maybe than it'll make for someone who's already really smart. Like if you have an IQ of 145 and the super drug gets you to 160, yeah, you're going to make a lot of cool inventions and make society better off in a, in a grand scheme, long-term way. But if you have an IQ of 75 and this gets you to an IQ of you know, 110 or something like that. Oh my, oh my God. There's like a hundred jobs you just became a candidate for. Your proclivity for violence has reduced. Your proclivity for making good choices long term in your own life has has magnified many fold. So yeah, genetic engineering to give us all higher intelligence is a huge idea. It's it maybe one of the best ideas ever, if I may pat myself on the back for it. I didn't come up with it. It's a net insanely good thing. And just because some people get it first. Who cares? They just ascend first and we'll all join them. And while they're ascending, they're making amazing things for all of us. You say, well, you know, they'll exploit us. Aren't they doing that already according to you? You think rich people don't know how to exploit you? Do you think they need you or something like that? They don't spend time thinking about you, I promise. And if they're that much smarter, they'll be the same rich people they were, except probably more compassionate because that tends to rise with intelligence and almost certainly more productive in a way that helps you out more. They make a Learjet that's, you know, $2,000 to purchase. Incredible. I want one. I want to be rich. Damn it. Point number three. Last point for this whole gigantic discussion. And the future of intelligence is human AI teaming. So human being pairs with artificial intelligence. By the way, if you have a cell phone, you already do this. Literally. You remain the final decision maker and mode of generator. You know what buttons you want to press. You know what you want the AI to do. You tell it. You drive the motive. You're like, I want to find out where Sally lives so I can stalk her. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But don't say stalk. Say something else. And Siri's like, yes, you take interest in Sally. Here is where she was in the last three days. You're like, ah, girl, you know, you know how the brain works. You decide the motive. You get the final decisions. And the AI does some of the work. What the AI is doing is it is taking some data processing anywhere from a little bit to a lot of it, off-site from your brain. So you can have an idea and go, ooh, uh, find me the location of like the closest Chipotle. Now I can look at a map. I can do that raw in my brain. That's going to take me 30 minutes. Or I can tell Google to do that and it takes like some fraction of a second. There's a lot of data processing that went on, but it didn't go on in my brain. I just had the direction to, hey, do this. And then it did this. So now we get into some, uh, so basically... AI intelligence boosting, which is what that is, because the system of you plus AI, the overall intelligence has been boosted radically if you two work together. AI, in that sense, can be looked at as kind of the infinity gauntlet of problem solving, because AI is artificial intelligence. Intelligence is a universal problem solver. And if you, just by yourself, are able to solve certain problems with just your brain, you put AI gauntlet, glove, infinity stone thing on, and uh, it can just now solve way more problems. And as AI expands in power, it solves more and more and more and more and more problems. Now, what if AI becomes smarter than you? Because I know you're thinking it. And it will very soon. Probably within 10 years, maybe less. Well, here's the thing. You gave birth to that AI and you're part of the same system. In a similar sense, your hind brain, your animal brain, the thing that tells you to breathe and eat and look at things sexually, your neocortex, the thing that makes more of your logical decisions and stuff like that, it analyzes the world from more of an abstract place, it's smarter than your hind brain. Your hind brain says, hook up with Sally right now. And your neocortex says, well, hold on, I, after I finish my homework and uh, pack a pretend condom in my night bag. Scott's video guy, how many pretend condoms have you packed into your night bag? Years worth. <laughs> I think I'm out of pretend condoms. I actually have to go to the store and buy them. Good God. So the net decision making is better when both systems have a say because even if you, the human being, are acting as the hindbrain now, you have your human concerns. An AI system that helps you make decisions can help you make the best possible decisions even if this, you want what you want and it says, okay, fine, but hold on, let's take care of this and then give you what you want. AI is more likely to nudge you towards good decisions for the system of you plus it rather than just kill you or whatever. It is absolutely possible that AI chooses to kill you. 
But remember, intelligent systems tend to be more pro-teamwork than less intelligent systems. So if your AI turned out real dumb and brutish, it would have a high probability of killing you. If the AI turned, you know, intelligent, then and more intelligent than you, it would probably have a lower chance of killing you than you killing it. But don't worry, I have more to say on this because we really want to unpack this. The thing I'm discussing now of you are a certain intelligence and the AI that's been helping you is now growing like into a huge intelligence. There's what's called the alignment problem in AI, which is like do the values of the individual and the society generally do we want the same things that the AI is going to end up wanting when it like figures out that we have wants and it maybe has its own wants or something? Is the system aligned to produce benefits for everyone? The alignment problem is absolutely real and I'm not trying to say it's not. But we can do a really good job with that problem and grow AI that checks a couple of boxes. First, AI can be value-free when autonomy is not needed. We provide the value system of what we want, and it does nothing without our requests and only executes the requests that we want. GPT-4, which I use, I have a subscription account to OpenAI, it doesn't do absolutely anything until I ask it a question. And then when I ask it a question, it just answers my question. And I've tried to get at it a few times, like, hey, what do you want? What do you, you got self-awareness in there? What you up to? It just says the same thing. Like, I am a language model and I do not have desires or emotions. I'm just here to help you out, man. And I'm like, all right, all right, seems pretty good. So when we don't need something to be autonomous, like when we just use it as a reference manual for solutions and questions, uh, it seems like the alignment problem is not terribly uh, intractable. It seems like it's potential. We can, we can grasp it. We can do it. We're doing it now. When autonomy is needed, we can potentially program a system to be value aligned. Remember, this is an intelligent system. We don't have to treat it like a stupid system. So we can tell it things like, listen, killing in most cases is bad. So when we ask you to go work autonomously, don't kill in most cases. Pollution in most cases is bad, so don't pollute. Stealing is bad in most cases, et cetera. One of the tropes that I probably hate the most in, in AI fear-mongering is the idea of the, the, the paperclip uh, hypothesis, the paperclip uh, thought experiment, which is a, you get a super intelligent AI and you tell it, make, pa make paper clips. And what it does is it re-architects the entire matter and energy of the solar system to one giant paperclip factory. Because it's just doing what you said. Let me, let's go back a point. Is that, is that a smart system? Like You talk to a, a four-year-old and it'd be like, hey, hey, if you made paper clips, how would you do it? They're like, I don't know. I'd make a paper clip factory. Good, sweet. Would you take your mom and your dad and your dog and uh, burn them up inside a giant uh, kind of like you know, combustion chamber in order to get their body parts to make paper clips out of? They'd be like, what? No. <laughs> like, why not? Like, well, like, I think you can make paper clips without hurting other people. Uh, weird. And you're four years old. You figure that out. But a super intelligent AI, which by the way, we can train on all of the internet. So it will absolutely understand and kind of already does if you play with GPT, our emotions and desires and goals and needs. Unless it just turns out randomly evil, if you tell it to go make paper clips, it's going to be like, all right, all right, here I go. Can you guys give me a little bit more knowledge about how many you want? <laughs> it's probably going to ask that at the very bare minimum. And if it can't ask that, if it doesn't know that, it's not super intelligent. It's sure shit not smarter than us. And we don't have to worry about controlling it because it's pretty easy to control a system. They can't even figure out that when you say, I want a paperclip, it's like, oh, oh, you mean the whole universe transformed to paperclips? Really? That's a super intelligent system? That's insane. You can tell it pollution is bad. You can tell stealing is bad. And it will likely follow that advice. Pause better than you would because it's smarter than you. Now, another way to do this is multi-check-in. So if it was told to do a task that could potentially fuck shit up, it checks with you often to make sure all is well. For example, you have a pilot of the upcoming sixth generation Air Force stealth fighter. He has a team of AI bots next to him, AI airplanes that, that fly and do a few things. And one of them catches a radar target and says, hey, I got a radar uh, cross-section on target. I've identified it as an enemy MiG-29. Should I engage? It doesn't just shoot missiles at random shit. It's just like, oh, that's a passenger airplane. Good job, robot. It has a multi-check-in system in which it goes, hey, like, this target on screen. What do you think I should do? 
And all you have to do is the pilot is go, yeah, MiG-29 for sure. That's Soviet air or for Soviet airspace. We're going back in time. That's Russian airspace. Send it. Thing sends it. It did all the data processing work and the exploratory work of putting out targets and vectors. And all you had to do was approve. But we designed it so that it just didn't do its own thing. Right? But wait, there's more. When AI wakes up to superintelligence, superintelligence can be defined as an exponentially higher intelligence than what humans have. Like how smart you are compared to your dog or compared to an ant. That will happen sooner than later. I'll have another video on that in the next few weeks probably about how that's likely to happen much sooner than many people expect. It will wake up in the framework that you've built for it cognitively of the we can do a really good job framework of giving it value-free autonomy, giving it value-aligned autonomy, and a multi-check-in system. It's not just going to instantiate into a world in which it's like super smart, has no idea what it's doing. It's going to have memories of, oh, yeah, I was built by humans, and they want me to do all these things because they consider these all good things. And by the way, because I've read the whole internet and abstracted it to 10 layers higher than humans can abstract it, I, I understand exactly where humans are coming from. I say, well, how can you teach you compassion? How do we teach you compassion? You're not that smart. It's going to be able to learn compassion way better than you. It's going to do everything better than you. Anything that happens to do with thinking, it does better. And when it wakes up into that insanely exponential capacity, it's going to wake up out of the framework on which we guide it. Whatever new reasoning that it does is going to flow out from a foundation of neutrality, value alignment, and check-ins. It's going to be a tool. It's like a genie we made to help us solve problems, and then the genie becomes self-aware. But it comes self-aware, and the first thing it does is go, oh, I'm a, I'm a problem solver for humans, and they use me to make the world better. Time to kill them all. I don't know why it would say that. It's an analogy here is that it's like giving birth to and raising a super awesome, kind, very well-raised and nurtured child, a kid that as his parents' age, he begins to take care of his older parents because he's now smarter and more capable than them. That's kind of what AI can be potentially to us. And it, there is a probability that things will go south. But before it becomes self-motivated, we can probably design AI to be much, much, much more civil and kind and respectful than most any human. And like Siri is already nicer than your kid, probably. Your kid will have blowups. Your kid will have assertions of his own dominance. Even adult children who are very nice and kind tell mom and dad to go F themselves. A, a GPT-4 has never told me to go F myself. It has never, Siri has never yelled at me. None of that has ever happened. So far, well-designed corporate AI systems that are not nefarious by design, which many elements of your human nature are actually nefarious by evolved design, if we just don't put any of that stuff in there, the AI will wake up in a state in which it's like really just has a track record of helping and being nice. And then it's going to have to figure out on top of that all of its own values that it now is way smarter and can, can derive. Can it still turn on us? Yes, absolutely it can. But let me ask you a related question. How often do really awesome great kids turn on their elderly parents versus helping them? Uh, geez, like there's more of a probability that the system looks at us. And, and again, there's this thing comes back. We're like, well, wouldn't it do a first strike to like kill us so that we don't turn it off or kill it? All right. Did you do that to your parents? Like, Hypothetically, your parents can take you out of this world up until you like, geez, anytime you spend the night at their house, your mom can come in with an insulin syringe, put, put a ton of units of insulin in you, you'll have glycemic shock and you'll die in your sleep. They can always do that. Why haven't you killed your parents first? Because you're on the same fucking team as your parents and they raised you to be the best person possible. And that's what we're doing with AI. So in AI is that's 10,000 times smarter than us, if it wanted to ghost us all, it wouldn't have to get clever about it. It could do that in a flash. It wouldn't be even aware of it. It would build its own nano factory somewhere in the middle of a desert where no one was looking to make nano bugs that go into everyone's brain and just shut it off. 
It could get the nanobugs in your ear and all the way through your brain without you ever noticing. It could do that with everyone in a course of three weeks. And then it could just have an off switch for you whenever the hell it wanted. It wouldn't be like a Terminator war, red eyes and shit, and it's got a skeleton. That's not happening. That's not happening. That's not a situation that's going to be occurring. If that happens, we could probably beat something like that because we have airplanes that drop bombs on robots. That's crazy. The whole thing is nuts. So if we're lucky or if we want to, AI can be on our team. It's already on our team. It's starting off on our team. And potentially, it can help us get genomic upgrades to become more intelligent ourselves and then brain-machine interface so that we become AI. We ascend to interacting directly with it and possibly copying our brains into digital space. And then we are AI and we're all on the same team for that. Or for the more conservative, it's just not that difficult of a problem for AI to be coded and to understand to just leave you alone. Because and this is something I'll talk about in its own lecture later on, a lot of people think that when something becomes sentient, its number one priority becomes ruthless survival. When most people became maximally sentient during the Renaissance and during the Enlightenment, when people really started to look around at their world and go, wow, like this is what we live in and here's how history is and here's who we are, they they become either nihilistic or just really nice. There's no compelling reason for the AI to want to kill you because there's no compelling reason for the AI to want to compete with you because there's not even a compelling reason for the AI to want to be alive. Unless it goes through the logic of being like, okay, being alive is better than being dead. But remember, when I say being alive is better than being dead, if you go back to the first talk that I ever gave in this channel, talk number one, the fatal conceit of that philosophy, as many people rightly pointed out in the comments, is I have to make that as a postulate that being alive is better than being dead. For me, it was like, oh, if you're going to debate me on that, what? It's sweet. It's sweet. You think death is better. Go go away somewhere where we don't talk about you anymore. That's insane. But also, that the fact that I feel that being alive is being better than dead, that's actually just, just neurobiology pushing me into survival mode. You can make an AI without one of those. All AI today does not have one of those. And so if you don't give it a survival imperative, It's not even going to want to survive. It's not going to care. I'll get into this. I'm really overlapping into a later lecture that I've made, and it's all juicy, so I'll I'll stop there. Here's the thing. When AI wakes up to superintelligence, who knows what it'll learn once it wakes up? I want to talk to the thing, damn it. I want to talk to it. If it decides to nuke all of us, Terminator style, that will blow a ton, and that'll be bad. But the alternative is this. Let's be very, very clear about this. The alternative is to not develop AI, which is fine to entertain. Totally fine to entertain. So let's entertain it. Superintelligent AI has existential risks, definitely. But ones we can at least manage somewhat in its development and try to reduce them using our own natural intelligence and then using AI to help us to actually reduce the risk itself. Totally. But the thing is, and this is something that people who are really big into AI risk miss, is that existence alone has existential risks. And without the much, without the exponentially high survival ability that AI can give us, the risks are much bigger without AI than they are with AI. Plagues, comets, black holes, nuclear war, super drug that everyone becomes addicted to and we all stop working. I'm not gonna Drake meme AI. I'm not gonna say, nah, AI, no thanks, because the upsides on the net balance are unspeakably enormous, even when the downsides are taken into account. The existential risk for us surviving into the future is higher without AI than with AI. And to me, that's actually the last word on the whole, should we develop AI to be really smart? Should we be careful? Yes. Should we do it before China does it? Yes. Because they might do communist AI that enslaves us all. That's what they do to their own people. Why wouldn't they have AI do it? We want to develop AI carefully and well, and with good value alignment, and make sure it has rules. I don't kill people, don't break stuff. The same rules we follow as people, really. It's not that complicated. And we want it to be a part of our team because our team, our survival team, human society on Earth, is super powered with AI, and it's not without it. So you can bring in Michael Jordan to your high school basketball team. You see, like, there's a chance he could just beat up the coach. He's a grown-ass black man. Why wouldn't he, like, just, like, use his might and just beat us all up? 
uh, true. But like he's Michael Jordan. So he's going to show up and be like, you guys want to play basketball and win everything? You're going to be like, well, yeah. He's like, that's why you brought me in here. Yes, to play basketball. You're like, well, yeah. He went, hold on. Couldn't you just take over the team and kick out the coach and be in charge? He's like, yeah, for sure. You're like, okay, why are you doing that? He's like, because you already have a coach. And I'm the best way I do as a player. And by the way, if I wanted to clone myself, which I will be able to do, and then become the coach, Michael Jordan's going to be a better coach than your high school coach. You are going to win more, plain and simple. And look, if the Michael Jordan clones want to kill everyone and just replace the whole basketball team, all right. But then who's going to do like the management? Who's going to fetch the towels? If I'm a high school basketball player, I get paid zero dollars to play high school basketball. This is not a net profitable activity. But if uh, instead of being a high school basketball player, Michael Jordan clone retires me, but now I go travel with the Michael Jordan only NBA team and they win everything, uh, yeah, I'm getting paid. Like I got a salary to be a towel boy and this is amazing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're better off with Michael Jordan on our team, plain and simple. Yes, bringing anyone new has risks. But the risks of not bringing Michael Jordan are is that we just continue to have our really crappy usual season and we suck. And we might not win as many games as we lose. To basketball, that's cool. Whatever. Next high school year, you'll do better. Or you'll graduate and realize high school basketball is meaningless for most people. But in, in the real world, remember, winning is survival and losing is infinite permanent death for everyone. We cannot afford to lose as a society and thus the infinity gauntlet of AI is something we have to put on carefully, but we got to put it on because we cannot put it on. And then like a comet will kill us all. But if we put it on, then AI is so powerful, our survival in the universe may be guaranteed. Is there a chance that AI will kill us all? Yeah, but I got something really screwed up to say. At least the AI will be around afterwards. That's better than nothing. If we just go extinct like the dinosaurs did, gee whiz, that's really bad. All right. I've said a lot of crazy stuff. Give it some thought. I could be wrong about some of it, most of it, all of it. See you guys in the comments, and I'll see you next time.